evening, evening, evening life. Evening life. Evening life. Evening life with the Alpha Master. Let's get it. Evening life. Evening life with the Alpha Master. Let's get it. Let's get it, man. What the? Hey, that's the Nivaldo. It's gonna be like, like, knock. And then Nivarius is like the opposite. It's open up. But anyway, guys, this is the Alpha Master. And today we're gonna start with uh, chapters 12 and 13. Remember that extreme heat, hard, maximum exertion activity is going to be some five. And then the environmental influences on activity are going, are going to be extreme heat, extreme cold, altitude, and air quality and pollution. And in here, an, an air quality and pollution. So anyways, guys, this is going to be a CPT Model 7 note uh, from chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12 is going to be concepts of resistance training. And chapter 13 is going to be uh, exercise selection and technique. And by the way, exercise selection and technique is, is a sound session overall when you search the, the study guide. Did, did, I, did I close it though? No, it's right here. Uh, yeah, it's going to be in the 25% uh, program design and implementation. The principles of program design in one of the not, but like uh, in exercise selection technique and training instruction. It's actually going to be 15% of your test. Corrective, correcting technique and monitor clients. So we're going to get started now. Chapters 12 and 13. Yesterday we went over chapters 12 and 11. Today we're going to go over chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12 is going to be concept of resistance training. And chapter 13 is exercise selection and technique, which is going to be 15% of your examination week. So for concepts of resistance training, we're going to look at the benefits of resistance training. You're going to look at over the strength training principles. Then we have the principle of specificity, the principle of reversibility, and the principle of pro the principle of progressive overload. Then you have the acute variables of re for resistance training, which are going to be frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, which is going to be the fit principle. Then you have rest, tempo, range of motion, repetitions, and sets. You have in total nine acute variables for resistance training: frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, rest. Th then you have rest, rep tempo, range of motion, repetitions, and sets. Then you have free weights versus weight machines. Then you have the benefits and drawbacks of each uh, for free weights versus weight machines. Then you have the body weight exercises. You have some body weight exercises that you have to remember. Then you, you have the strength curves. You have strength curves ascending, descending, and bell shaped. You have isolation exercises, compound exercises, and the strength categories, which are going to be five in total. The strength categories are five in total. You have a, a starting strength, relative strength, Maximum strength, speed strength, and power. You're gonna see that shit on, or you're gonna see that on the workbook. Starting, starting strength, relative strength, maximum strength, uh, speed strength, and uh, uh, speed strength and power. Then you have the explosive movement phases. You have a phase one is eccentric, phase two is amortization phase, and phase phase three is concentric phase. And then you have supersets versus drop sets and tapering. The definition of tapering. I'm gonna look at it right now. What is tapering? Typering is going to be the process of becoming thinner or narrower to answer and the process of gradually lessening or reducing something. The process of gradually lessening or reducing something. That's going to be tapering. Uh, uh, yeah, let's get it, bro. That, that's going to be the concept of resistance training before going over exercise selection and technique. Let's get started with chapter 12, concepts of resistance training. We have no time to waste in here. The environmental influence and activity are going to be extreme heat, extreme cold, altitude, and air quality and pollution. So that's going to be... A, a CPT Model 7 notes that Chapter 12 is Concepts of Resistance Training. So the learning objectives for the concepts of resistance training are going to be to list the benefits of strength training for general health and fitness. You need to list the benefits of strength training for general health and fitness. You have to list the benefits of strength training for general health and fitness. Describe applying strength training principles uh, to achieve specific adaptations. Describe applying strength training principles to achieve specific adaptations. Explain the manipulation of acute training variables to drive strength training adaptations. And finally, describe the common types of resistance training equipment. Describe the common types of, of resistance training equipment. 
So you have the learning objectives for the chapter 12 concept of resistance training. The learning objectives are going to be to list the benefits of strength training for general health and fitness. You have to describe applying strength training principles to achieve specific adaptations. To, to achieve specific adaptations. Then you have to explain the manipulation of acute training variables to drive strength training adaptations. Explain the manipulation of acute training variables to, uh, to drive strength training adaptations. And finally, you have to describe the common types of resistance training equipment. You have to describe the common types of resistance training equipment, which are going to be free weights and weight machines. Uh, free weights and weight machines, yeah. All right. The benefits of resistance training, you have several benefits of resistance training. It increases lean body mass. Resistance training increases lean body mass, increases the resting metabolic rate. It, it reduces fat mass and type 2 diabetes prevention and management, enhances cardiovascular, it enhances, enhances the cardiovascular system, uh, promoting bone development and reversing aging in skeletal muscle. It's going to be the benefit of resistance training. Benefits of resistance training is that it increases increasing the lean body mass. It increases the lean body mass, increases, increases the resting metabolic rate. Uh, it reduces fat mass and types to uh, and type to diabetes prevention and management. It enhances cardio enhances cardiovascular pro prompting bone enhancing cardiovascular pro prom pro promotes bone development and reverses aging in skeletal muscle. It's going to be seven benefits in total. It increases blink body mass, increases resting metabolic rate, reduces fat mass. Type 2 diabetes prevention and management, enhancing car cardiovascular, promoting bone development and reversing aging in skeletal muscle. So that's, that's going to be the, the benefit of strength training for the general health and fitness. Increases lean body mass, increases resting metabolic rate, reduces fat mass. Uh, uh, type 2 diabetes prevention and management, enhances cardiovascular, promotes bone, bone development and reverses aging in skeletal muscle. Seven benefits of strength training for general health and fitness. For general health and fitness. Now, describe applying strength training principles to achieve specific adaptations. Now, the strength training principles to achieve specific adaptations. You have the strength training principles, which are going to, going to be the principle of specificity, the principle of reversibility, and the principle of progressive overload. That's going to be the strength training principles. Principle of specificity, of reversibility, and progressive overload. The principle of specificity, of reversibility, and progressive overload. The principle of specificity is going to be what does the client want to accomplish with body composition goals we have, and does he, she has a specific performance goal. It's going to be the principle of, of, of specificity. Principle of specificity. What does the client want to accomplish with body composition goals that we have? Principle of specificity. What does the client want to accomplish with the body composition goals that we have? And that he or she has a common performance goal. Have a common performance goal. Now, the principle of reversibility, or as part, as part of the strength training principles, is going to be use it or lose it idea. Uh, use it or lose it idea. The principle of reversibility is the use it or lose it idea. If we stop training for a period of time, gains that we have will naturally reverse to is into beginner status. So use it or lose it idea. If we stop training for a prolonged period of time. The gains that we have, we naturally reverse into a beginner's status. That's going to be the principle of reversibility. And finally, the principle of progressive overload. The principle of progressive overload is going to be that the body needs to be able to overcome some stress that is greater than what he or she is normally capable of. That's the principle of progressive overload. That the body needs to be able to overcome some stress that he or she uh, has that is greater than what he or she is normally capable of. So those are the three strength training principles. Describe the applying strength training principles to achieve specific adaptations. So those, those are going to be the three strength training principles, which are going to be the principle of specificity, reversibility, and of progressive overload. Uh, the principle of specificity, what does the client want to accomplish with the body composition goals that we have, and that he or she has a, a specific performance goal. Reversibility, use it or lose it idea. If we stop training for a period of time, gains that we have will naturally reverse into the beginner status. And principle of progressive overload is that the body needs to be able to overcome some strength that is greater than what he or she is normally capable of. That's the principle of progressive overload, that the body needs to be able to overcome some stress that is greater than, than what he or she is normally capable of. That body needs to be able to overcome some stress that he, the, 
the principle of progressive overload is that the body needs to be able to overcome some stress that is greater than what he or she is normally capable of. That's the no principle of progressive overload. The body needs to be able to overcome some stress that is greater than what he or she is normally capable of. It's normally capable of. Now, the acute variables for resistance training. Acute variables for resistance training are going to be the amount and type of stress placed on us during a session. That's the acute variables for resistance training. Acute variables for resistance training. The amount and type of stress placed on us during a session. That's acute variables for resistance training. Frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, rest, tempo, range of motion, repetitions, and sets. The, the three acute, the nine acute variables for resistance training. The explain and manipulation of acute training variables to address strength training adaptations. So the acute variables for resistance training. The acute variables for resistance training are going to be frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, rest, tempo, range of motion, repetitions, and sets. Those are going to be the acute variables. The acute variables for resistance training are going to be frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, rest, tempo, range of motion, repetitions, and sets. So we start with frequency. Frequency is the number of times that we are training in a given period of time. The number of times that we are training in a given time period is going to be, the, for example, one, one week, one month, a year, etc. It's, it's going to be how often a muscle and group of muscles are being trained. How often a muscle and group of muscles are being trained? How often a muscle and group of muscles is being trained? That's going to be frequency. Uh, it's the number of times that we are training in a given time period. Uh, 48, to 72 hour, 48 to 72 hours for muscle to repair before it can be trained. You need 48 to 72 hours for the muscle to repair before it can be, before it can be trained again. How often a muscle and group of muscles is being trained? It's how often a muscle or group of muscles is being trained. Uh, training frequency progresses with fitness level of the client. The training frequency is how often you how often you work out progresses with the fitness level of the client. Now the intensity is going to be the amount of effort put forward during a given resistance exercise. It's going to be intensity, the amount of effort that is put forward during a given resistance exercise. Expressed into percentages of one way a repetition max. Muscular endurance increases 67% or less. So the intensity is going to be the amount of effort put forward in a given a resistance exercise. It's going to be intensity. The amount of effort put forward during a given resistance exercise. Intensity is the amount of effort that is being put forward during a given resistance exercise. Express it into percentages of one repetition max. Express it into percentages of one repetition max. So the intensity, the amount of effort that is put forward during a given resistance exercise. It's going to be expressed into percentages of one repetition max. The muscular endurance intensity, the muscular endurance increase is going to be 67% or less. For a, for a training goal of muscular endurance increase, you have an intensity of 67% of le or less. So why do I have so, like, my, my nose, like, why does it, like, it calls so much, dude. It's so annoying. So for a training goal of muscular endurance, you have an intensity of 67% or less. For hypertrophy, the training intensity or muscle growth, hypertrophy, the, the intensity of in one repetition max is 67% to 85%. For maximum strength, you have 85% or greater. For power single repetition events, you have a, a intensity of 80 to 90%. And for muscle, for multiple repetition event, you have it, you have it from 75 to 85%. It's going to be intensity. Amount of effort that is being put forward in a given resistance exercise. Express it into percentages of one repetition max. Muscular endurance increase is going to be 67% or less. For hypertrophy or muscle, muscle growth is from 67% to 85%. For maximum strength is 85% or greater. For power single repetition event is going to be 80 to 90%. And for multiple repetition event, it's going to be 75% to 85%. It's going to be the acute variable for resistance training. It's going to be frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, rest, tempo, range of motion, repetitions, and, set, and sets. So the frequency is going to be the number of times that we are training in a given time period, one week, one month, etc. How often a muscle or a group of muscles is being trained. Intensity is the amount of effort that is being put forward during a given ex resistance exercise. A present to percentage of one repetition max. Muscular endurance increase is going to be 67% or, or less. For or less intensity, 
For hypertrophy, muscle growth is going to be from 67% to 85% of intensity. For maximum strength, it's 85% or greater. Power single repetition event is 80% to 90% for a power single repetition event. It's going to be from 80 to 90%. And for multiple repetition event, it's going to be from 75% to 85% for multiple repetition event. 75% to 85%. Now, uh, now, for time duration, time refers to the amount of time an activity or exercise section lasts. Time refers to the total amount of time an activity or exercise section lasts. Time, total time. So the time refers to the total amount of time uh, that an activity or exercise selection la lasts. Total amount of time an activity or exercise selection la section lasts. Uh, time is also used to measure duration of planet bouts of exercise. Time is also used to measure the duration of planet bouts of exercise. It's going to be common for cardiovascular exercise to have a planned amount of time associated with each session, accumulating time doing general fitness activities. Uh, accumulating time doing, doing general physical activity can count for long-term health benefits. I mean, time duration. Time refers to the total amount of time an activity or exercise session lasts. Time is also used to measure the duration of planet, of the planet bouts of exercise. Now, the common is co it is common for cardiovascular exercise to have a planned amount of time uh, associated with each session and accumulating time for uh, doing general physical activity. So accumulating time doing general phys physical activity can count for long-term health benefits. So accumulating time doing f general physical activity can, ca can account for long-term health benefits. Accumulating time doing, doing general physical activity can account for long-term health benefits. Now, type is going to be the mode of exercise. Type is going to be the mode of exercise. What type are you doing? It's going to be the mode of exercise. Several possible exercise types with various tools. Barbell, the cable, the kettlebell, the dumbbell. Within each type are two important sub-variables, the grip or hand placement and the breath control to a range of motion. So type is going to be the mode of exercise. Several possible exercise types with various tools. So you have the you have the tools like the barbell, the cable, the kettlebell, and the dumbbell. So within each type, there are two important sub-variables. There are two important sub-variables for the type. The grip or the handle placement, and the breast control to the range of, to other range of motion. So you have the grip or the handle placement. You have the grip or the handle placement, or the hand placement. You have the grip or the hand, the hand placement, and the breath control to a range of motion. The breath control to a range of motion, throughout the range of motion. Now you have tempo. What's going on? Now you have tempo, which determines how much time under tension mu muscle tissues are during a given set of exercises. That's going to be tempo. That determines how much time under tension muscle tissues are during a given set of exercises. That's going to be tempo. Determines how much time under tension muscle tissues are during a given set of exercises. That's going to be the tempo, which determines how much time under tension, uh, how much time under tension our muscle tissues are during a given set of exercises. You have four different phases. You have four different phases. You have the muscular endurance, hypertrophy, maximum strength, and power. For muscular endurance, you have a tempo of 4 seconds, 0 seconds, 6 seconds, 0 seconds. For hypertrophy, you have a tempo of 3-1-3-1. Three, one, three, one. For maximum strength, you have a tempo of 3-0-1-3-1-0. Three, 3-0-1-0 zero, three, one, zero. Three, zero, one, zero for maximum strength. And for power, you have a fastest controllable tempo. Notice how the muscular endurance growth is high. And it gets lower with hypertrophy, with maximum strength, and power is the fastest controllable tempo. Which determines how much time under tension muscle tissues are during a given set of exercise. So you have four different phases. You have the muscular endurance, which you're going to have a tempo of 4060. 4060. Then you have the hypertrophy, which you have a tempo of 3131. Then you have maximum strength, which you have a tempo of 3010. And then you have power, which is the fastest controllable tempo. Now, range of motion is the total amount of movement over a specific joint or body part. It's going to be the range of motion. The range of motion, which is the, the determines how much time under... No, so, sorry, the range of motion. 
the range of motion is the total amount of movement around a specific joint or body type. It's going to be the range of motion. It's going to be the total amount of movement over a specific joint or body part. Range of motion is going to be the total amount of movement around a specific joint or body part. Can be manipulated to meet many objectives. A partial rest can be done to build up an increased range of motion. Full range of motion shown to have greater increase in strength, size, and subcontinuous fat loss. The range of motion is the total amount of movement over a specific joint or body part. It's going to be the range of motion, the total amount of movement around a specific, a specific joint or body part. The total amount of movement around a specific joint or body part. It's going to be the range of motion, the total amount of movement around a specific joint or body part or body type. Or body type. The range of motion is the total amount of movement around a specific joint or body type. Can be manipulated. It can be ma uh, that range of motion, the total amount of movement around a specific joint or body type. Can be manipulated to meet many objectives. Uh, some of them are going to be partial wraps that are going to be can be done to build up an increased range of motion. It's going to be partial wraps that can be done to build up an increased range of motion. And the full range of motion, which is going with which is shown shown to have greater increases in strength, size and subcontinuous fat loss. The full range of motion which is shown to have a greater increase, it greater increases in strength, size, and subcontinuous fat loss. The range of motion total amount of movement around a specific joint or body type can be manipulated to meet many objectives. Partial reps can be done to build up an increased range of motion and, and full range of motion shown to have greater increases in strength, size, and subcontinuous fat loss. Now you have the repetitions. You have the repetitions in here. It's going to be the number of times a single range of motion is completed through one exercise. It's going to be the, re the repetitions. The number of times that a single range of motion is completed through one exercise. It's going to be the, the repetitions. The repetitions is going to be the number of times that a single range of motion is completed through, through one exercise. It's going to be repetitions. The number of times that a single range of motion is completed through one exercise. Repetitions is going to be the number of times that a single range of motion is completed through one exercise. Now, the training goal and repetitions. For muscular endurance, you have 15 or more repetitions. For hypertrophy, you have 6 to 12 repetitions. For maximum strength, you have from 1 to 6 repetitions. And for power, you have from 1 to 5 repetitions. Notice how it goes lower. Muscular endurance, you have 15 or more repetitions. Hypertrophy, you have from 6 to 12 repetitions. For max strength, you have 1 to 6 repetitions. And for power, you have 1 to 5 repetitions. Now, sets determine the overall volume of a given exercise. Determines the overall volume of a given exercise. It's going to be sets. It determines the overall volume of a given exercise. It's going to be the number of times that a group of repetitions is completed. Sets determines the overall volume of a given exercise. It's the number of times that a group of repetitions is completed. And in, in muscular endurance, you have from one to three sets. For hypertrophy, you have from, from three to four sets. For maximum strength and power, you have three to five sets. It's going to be sets. Determines the overall volume of a given exercise determines the overall volume of a given exercise. The overall volume of a given exercise, the number of times that a group of repetitions is completed, is going to be from muscular endurance is one to three sets, for hypertrophy is three to four sets, for max strength is going to be from three to five sets, and for power is also three to five sets. Finally, rest is going to be the amount of time allowed between sets for certain metabolic recovery. Rest is going to, to be the amount of time allowed between sets for certain metabolic recovery. The amount of time that is allowed between sets for certain metabolic recovery of exercise. The amount of time allowed between sets for certain metabolic recovery of exercise. That's going to be the rest. The amount of time allowed between sets for certain metabolic recovery of exercise. Now, for, I, for muscle endurance and hypertrophy, you have a rest, set, a rest period between sets of 30 to 60 seconds. For muscular endurance and hypertrophy, you have a rest between sets of 30 to 60 seconds. For maximum strength, you have from 2 to 5 minutes of rest. For maximum strength, from 2 to 5 minutes of rest. For maximum strength, so this is an, an ATP CP of, of a maximum heart rate of 5, from 90 to 100% in, intensity. So it's maximum strength. And then for power, it's 1 to 2 minutes of rest between sets. So the rest is the amount of time that is allowed between sets for certain metabolic recovery of exercise. For muscular endurance, it's from 30 to 60 seconds of rest. For hypertrophy, it's from 30 to 60 seconds of rest. Now, for maximum strength, it's going to be from 2 to 5 minutes. And for power, it's going to be 1 to 2 minutes. Now, in here, you have 
the free weights versus the weight machines. <sighs> free weights versus weight machines. Free weights is going to be loads not attached to an apparatus such as a barbells and dumbbells are going to be free weights. Loads that are not attached to an apparatus such as barbells and dumbbells. And weight machines are going to be pieces of equipment with a fixed or a variable range of motion. Pieces of equipment with a fixed or variable range of motion that uses gravity and a load to generate resistance. Uses gravity and a load to generate, to generate resistance. Now you're going to look at the benefits and drawbacks of free weights and weight machines. Remember, it was part of the the learning objectives. Common types of resistance training equipment, the free weight weight machines, kettlebells, and and dumbbells. Let me just go. Original motion. So now you have the the free weights versus weight machines. The free weights are loads that are not attached to an apparatus, such as a barbells and dumbbells. Free weights are going to be loads that are not attached to an apparatus. Free weights are not attached to an apparatus, such as barbells and dumbbells. Now, weight machines are going to be pieces of equipment with a fixed or variable range of motion that uses gravity and a load to generate uses gravity and a load to generate resistance. Now, we're going to look at the benefits of free weights. And robots of free weights. Ben benefits of free weights is going to be that it is less expensive and take up less storage space. More practical, they're going to be more practical in a home gym, allows joints to move throughout a full range of motion and our body to move more naturally, promote incorporation of compound movements on our exercise programs, and promote better overall muscular promote better overall muscular balance. So the benefit of free weight is going to be allows our joints to move through other full range of motion during the given movements that, ha that we have, promote incorporation of compound movements, promote better, promotes better overall muscular through balance in our bodies, promotes better overall muscular balance in our bodies, in our bodies. Now the drawbacks of free weights is going to be that it's in our bodies. The drawbacks of free weights is going to be that it tends to give us a little less control over my chin weights. The drawbacks of free weights is that it tends to give us a little less control over machine weights. It is not always possible to completely isolate an individual muscle with free weight exercises. That's the drawbacks. It gives us less control than machine weights. It gives us less control than, than machine weights. It's going to be that tends to give us a little less control over machine weights. It is not always possible to completely isolate an individual muscle with free weight exercises. The drawbacks is that it gives us less control than machine weights, require more physical space, and are not always possible to completely isolate individual muscles with these exercises. It tend to give us less control than machine weights, require more physical space, and not always possible to completely isolate individual muscles with these exercises. An individual muscle with these exercises, with free weight exercises. Now, the benefits of weight machines is that it is safer and easier to learn movement patterns than in free weights. Benefits of weight machines is that it is, it is safer and easier to learn movement patterns than, in the, than the free weights. It is quicker to use and focus more on the specific muscle strength. Quicker to use and focus more on the specific muscle strength. And it isolates muscles better than free weights in general. So the benefits of weight machines isolates a given muscle, a given single muscle or muscle groups for the purpose of generating progressive overload, faster, more efficient, and quicker, and, may, and may be safer as well. It may be safer as well. Now the drawbacks of weight machines are going to be the benefits of free weights. It's, it's, it's drawbacks is that it is working on a fixed range of motion, so we, we may not be able to develop muscular range of motion. So the drawbacks is that it is working on a fixed range of motion, so we may not be able to develop a muscular range of motion. There are drawbacks of weight machines that it is working on a fixed range of motion, so we may not be able to develop muscular range of motion. It is, it is working on a fixed range of motion, so we may not be able to develop muscular range of motion. Now, the body weight exercises is going to be push-ups and pull-ups exercises for movement pattern performing with no additional load. 
The body weight exercises like the push-ups and the pull-ups are a great way to learn movements so that we can develop strength and muscle and, and muscle hypertrophy. Exercises or movements performing with no additional load. A drawback is that there is no way to add resistance. A drawback of, of body weight exercises is that it is a drawback of body weight exercises is that, is that there is no way to add resistance. That's a drawback. There is no way to add resistance for body weight exercises. There is no way to add resistance in body weight exercises. Now, a, a great way to learn movement patterns so that we can develop strength and muscular hypertrophy with it mm -hmm. is going to be body weight exercises. Uh, body weight exercises is a great way to learn movements so that we can develop strength and muscular hypertrophy with it. It's going to be the body weight exercises like the push ups and pull ups. It's a great way to learn movements and we can develop strength and, mus and, muscle, and muscle hypertrophy with it. Exercises or, mo or movements performing with no additional load. Drawback is that there is no way to add resistance. It's a great way to learn movement patterns so that, and we can develop strength and muscular, I, and muscular hypertrophy with it. With it, with it. And that was part of chapter 12, resistance training. Uh, now we go over the, the world book. It's going to be page and the concepts of resistance training. It's going to be ATPCP. ATPCP is part of resistance training. It's going to be part of the ATPCP a mo a movement system that resistance training. Resistance training, less than 200 meters sprints, apply metrics and ballistics, three to five minutes for it's a required time for full recovery. Like Olympic is from 10 to 130 to 20 seconds, like badminton, soccer, uh, gymnastics, hockey, 100 to 400 meter sprints. It's going to be from 12 to 60 minutes of recovery. Time required for full recovery is going to be 12 to 60 minutes. Uh, time required for full recovery is going to be 20. Recovery is going to be 20 to 60 minutes. And finally, and finally, aerobic is going to be two minutes and longer for aerobic energy systems, two minutes and longer, like long distance running, swimming, uh, rowing and cycling is going to be a uh, time required for full recovery is going to be from 24 to 72 hours. The time required for full recovery is 24 to 72 hours. 24 to 72 hours, yeah. Here it is, bro. The concepts of resistance training in the workbook, the concepts of resistance training, chapter 12. Chapter 12, concepts of resistance training. Chapter 12, concepts of resistance training. And now you have five types of strength. You have strength categories. Fill in the following table of categories of strength. This wasn't on the, on the model, eh? This, fill in the following table of categories of strength. You have five categories of strength. Five strength categories in total. You have starting strength, relative strength, maximum strength, power, and speed strength. A strength category. Starting strength is the ability to recruit as many motor units as possible instantaneously at the start of a movement. That's starting strength when you instantaneously start. A starting strength. The ability to recruit as, mo as many motor units as possible instantaneously at the start of a movement. That's going to be starting strength. The, the ability to recruit as many motor units as possible instantaneously at the start of a movement. Relative strength is going to be determined by considering the individual's body weight. Relative strength determined by considering uh, the individual's body weight in a relation to the amount of resistance that they can overcome and found with the following calculation. It's going to be one range of motion divided by the body weight is equal to the force per unit of body weight. The relative strength. So the strength strength is the ability to recruit as many motor units as possible instantaneously at the start of a movement. A relative strength is going to be determined by considering the individual's body weight in relation to the amount of resistance that they can overcome and found with the following calculation. One range of motion divided by the body weight is going to be equal to the force per unit of body weight. Now the maximum strength is the ability of, of a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage in as many muscles, muscle fibers as possible. Maximum strength, the ability for a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage as many muscle fibers as possible. Now, power is a combination of strength and speed. That's power, the combination of strength and speed. Power, the combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate maximal tension as quickly as possible. Power is the combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate the maximal tension as quickly as possible. 
Now, speed strength is going to be the ability of a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. It's going to be speed strength. The ability of a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. Speed strength is going to be the ability of a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. So, fill in the following table of categories of strength. The starting strength is going to be the ability to recruit as many motor units as possible instantaneously at the start of a movement. Relative strength is going to be determined by considering the individual's body weight in relation to the amount of resistance that they can overcome and found with the following calculation. One ratio of motion divided by the body weight is going to be equal to the force per unit of body weight. Force per unit of body weight. The maximum strength is the ability for a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage as, in, as many muscle, fi muscle fibers as possible. It's the maximum strength. The ability for a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage in as many muscle fibers as possible is the maximum strength. The ability for a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage in as many muscle fibers as possible. Now, the power is a combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate maximal tension as quickly as possible is going to be the power. The combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate maximal tension as quickly as possible. Now, speed strength is going to be the ability for a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. It's going to be speed strength. The ability for a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. Speed strength is going to be the ability for a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. It's going to be the five strength categories. Starting strength, relative strength, maximum strength, power, and speed strength. Strong strength is going to be... The starting strength is the ability to recruit as many motor units as possible instantaneously as there is a movement. The relative strength is determined by considering the individual's body weight in relation to the amount of resistance that they can overcome. And um, found with the calling calculation, it's going to be one range of motion divided by the body weight. It's going to be equal to the force per unit of body weight, relative strength. Now, the maximum strength is the ability for a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage in as many muscle fibers as possible. Maximum strength is the ability for a muscle or muscle group to recruit and engage in as many, in as many muscle fibers as possible. Uh, as many muscle fibers as possible. Now in here you have the power is the combination of strength and speed. Power is the combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate maximal tension as quickly as possible is going to be power. The combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate maximal tension as quickly as possible is going to be power. The combination of strength and speed is going to be the ability for a muscle to generate the maximal tension as quickly as possible. That's going to be power. The combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate the maximal tension as quickly as possible. That's going to be power. The combination of strength and speed. The ability for a muscle to generate the maximal tension as quickly as possible. And finally, the speed strength is the ability for a muscle or muscle group to absorb the mid forces quickly. A speed strength is the ability of a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. To absorb and transmit forces quickly. A speed strength the ability of a muscle or muscle group to absorb and transmit forces quickly. Now, in here you have the three benefits of resistance training to absorb and transmit forces quickly. Now, in here, you have the three benefits of resistance training. Now, in here, you have the three benefits of resistance training. The three benefits of resistance training is going to be increasing lean body mass and resting metabolic rate. Three benefits of resistance training is that it increases lean body mass it increases lean body mass and resting metabolic rate. It reduces fat mass and type 2 diabetes prevention and management and reduces the resting blood pressure. It enhances cardiovascular, promotes bone development, and reverses aging in skeletal muscle. It's going to be the benefit of resistance training. It increases lean body mass and resting metabolic rate. Reduces fat mass and type 2 diabetes prevention and management. And re reduces, re reduces the resting blood pressure. Reduces resting blood pressure. Reduces resting blood pressure and enhances cardiovascular, promotes bone development, and uh, reverses aging in skeletal muscle. So the free benefits of resistance training that increases lean body mass and resting metabolic rate, reduces fat mass and types to diabetes prevention and management, and reduces resting blood pressure, and it enhances the cardiovascular, enhances cardiovascular, promoting bone development, and reversing aging in skeletal muscle.
Okay. Now, label the following strand curve. You have the ascending strand curve, the descending strand curve, and the bell-shaped strand curves. Ascending strand curve is going to be ascending, descending, and bell-shaped. So the ascending strand curve refers to an exercise which gets harder as you extend. Ascending strand curve gets harder as you extend. Descending strand curve it becomes easier as you reach the flexion, as you extend. The bench press and the squat, it becomes harder as you extend. You are flexing, it becomes harder. Full flexion, full extension. Ascending strength curve. Harder, the further that you that, that, that you that you extend. Ascending it becomes harder, the further that you extend. Descending it becomes easier. So whenever when you are fully extended, it is a descending, so ascending strength curve it becomes harder at the bottom of the movement. Full flexion. So you're doing this, it becomes harder at the bottom of the movement. Now the descending strength curve. Descending strength curve is going to be uh, descending strength curve. The lower part of the movement is the easier part, of, and the upper part of the movement is the hard part, like the shin up. Uh, example is going to be a shin up. When you are So the lower strength curve, it is harder at the beginning, like in a squat. Let's see what is a chin up. That's a chin up right there. It is has descending strength curve. The bench press and the squat are example of this with an ascending thread cord. They feel the hardest at the bottom of the movement, full flexion, and this is the top, full extension. So you have to feel that it is harder at the bottom of the movement and easier at the top. When it is fully flexed, it is harder. When it is fully extended, it is easier. That's, that's for a, that's for exercises with ascending strength curve. When the, when it talks about descending strength curve, it's the opposite. You, you, you should feel it, they are easier at the bottom of the movement and harder at the top of the movement. When, when it's full flexion, it should be easier. When it's full extension, it should be harder. The extension should be the hardest part, like a push exercise. It's going to be the same strength curve in a push exercise. And I think this is an example of an exercise with a descending strength curve. You are the strongest at the start of the movement when you start to pull yourself up, ascending, descending strength curve, and movement that enables you to produce more force at the mid-range position between flexion and extension of a joint. So when you are flexing, it is it is harder. When you are extend, when when you're extending, it's easier. So you have to think about bench press and squat for ascending strength curve. For descending strength curve, you have to think about the chin up, or you have to think about like push exercises. But when you extend, it all is going to be harder than then if, if you press. Let me see them out like. And then you have the bell-shaped curve. Bell-shaped curve at the middle is harder. Bell-shaped curve is going to be when at the middle it is harder. Like a barbell curl. Bell shape curl, it becomes harder at the middle. There are issues of the check and the, at the end points and much challenging in the middle. Yeah, like a pull up. A pull up is also a bell shaped curve. Bell shape, they are harder 
at the middle of the movement. So ascending they are harder at the end of the movement. Descending they are harder at the at the beginning of the movement. And bell shape they are harder at the middle of the movement. Ascending is going to be like the bench press, like the bench press. Uh, descending is going to be like a like a chin up. And finally the bell shape is going to be like a like 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 a dumbbell curl. A dumbbell curl is going to be like a bell shape exercise for a joint angle at the bell shape. Isolation and compound exercises. Isolation and activation exercises. Define isolation exercises. Isolation exercises and give an example. A single joint exercise that primarily activate an individual muscle or a smaller muscle group. The biceps curl, the triceps extension, the leg curl and leg extension are going to be examples. Isolation exercises improve muscle control, strength and hypertrophy while also working to balance musculature as long as both the agonist and antagonist muscles are worked to enhance the physique and strengthen the connective tissue. Isolation exercises are also help target muscles that are not fully activated during compound movements. For example, research have found that, that hamstring activation is inherently low during exercises such as the leg press or the squat. Uh, and the squat to help strengthen the hamstrings, one can perform isolation movements. It, the isolation exercises they focus on one muscle group specifically. Now, compound exercises engage multiple joints and many muscle groups throughout the range of motion. The multi joint movements exercises that require the use of multiple muscles or muscle groups. Compound exercises increase muscle hypertrophy, and bone density, and strengthen connective tissues. Examples include the squats, the lunges, the deadlifts, and the bench press and the chin ups. So isolation exercises are going to be single joint exercises that probably activate an individual muscle or a small or a smaller muscle group. The biceps curl, the triceps extension, the leg curl and leg extension are examples. Isolation exercises improve muscle control, strength and hypertrophy while also working to balance musculature as long as both the agonist and antagonist muscles are worked to enhance the physique and strengthen the connective tissue. Isolation exercises also help target muscles that are not fully activated during compound movements. For example, research has found that hamstrings activation is inherently low during exercises just such as the leg, leg press and the squat. Research has found that hamstring activation is inherently low during exercises such as the bench press, such as the leg press and the squat. To help strengthen the hamstrings, one can perform isolation movements. Now, compound exercises, I gave an example, engage multiple joints and many muscle groups throughout the range of motion. Engage multiple joints and many muscle groups throughout the range of motion. Uh, multi-joint movement exercises that require the use of multiple muscles or muscle groups. Compound exercises increases muscle hypertrophy and bone density and strengthen the connective tissue and strengthens the connective tissues. Examples Examples include the squats, the lunges, the deadlifts, and the bench, the bench press, and the chin ups. It's going to be compound exercises. Engage multiple joints and many muscle groups throughout a range of motion. Multi joint movements exercises that require the use of multiple muscles or muscle groups. Compound exercises increase muscle hypertrophy and bone density and strengthen connective tissues. Examples and strengthen connective tissues. Examples include, examples include the squat. Examples include the squats, the lunges, the deadlifts, the bench press, and the chin ups. Now name name the three name the three phases of an explosive movement. The three phases of an explosive movement are going to be eccentric amortization and concentric phase. Those are the three phases of an explosive movement. Eccentric phase is going to be the loading phase of the movement. Amortization phase is a transition between the phase transition time between phases one and three and phase three. And concentric phase is gonna be the agonist taking advantage of the stored energy from the eccentric action and firing explosively. Like when you are going to throw like when you're gonna throw a ball, eccentric phase is going to be when you go all the way back here. Then amortization is going to be the transition time, like when you're throwing, and then concentric phase, the agonist takes advantage and it throws all the way. Eccentric goes the opposite and concentric because you have to go back here. Because if you go from here, the, your force is not going to be the same that if you go all the way from eccentric to concentric. From back here, it, the middle is it, not as strong as all the way. That's, a, that's an explosive movement. Eccentric is the loading phase of the movement. Amortization is a transition time between phases one and three. And concentric is going to be the agonist taking advantage of the stored energy from the eccentric action and firing explosively. 
Concentric is going to be the agonist taking advantage of the stored energy from the eccentric action and firing explosively. Stored energy from the eccentric action and firing explosively. Firing explosively. Period. Now, in here, you have free benefits and free drawbacks of free weights. We already covered that on the book. Benefits are going to be the free benefits and free drawbacks of free weights. The benefits of free weights are going to be more versatile. More versatile can target any muscle group, can help develop greater power as compared to machines, and require more of the smaller synergies and stabilizer muscles. They require more of the smaller synergists and stabilizer muscles, and drawbacks is going to be time consuming when changing weight requires more physical space and cannot isolate an individual muscle like weight machines. Now, the benefits and drawbacks of weight machines, the benefits is that they can, can isolate individual muscle groups effectively. They can isolate individual muscle groups effectively. There are more efficient use of space in the gym, more efficient use of space in the gyms, and they are going to be changing the resistance more efficiently and quicker. So you can change the resistance more efficient and quicker. Changing the resistance is going to be more efficient and quicker. And the drawbacks is going to be the movements are not as natural as in free weights. Drawbacks is that the movements are not going to be as natural as with the free weights. Harder to reach stabilizer and helper muscles. That is going to be harder to reach stabilizer and helper muscles. It's going to be harder to reach the stabilizer and helper muscles. It's going to be harder to reach the stabilizer and helper muscles or the synergies muscles, and specialized multiple machines are needed to get full body workout. And specialized multiple machines are needed to get a full, uh, are needed to get a full body workout. To get a full body workout, you need specialized multiple machines needed to get a full body workout. Now, a superset is going to be done by performing two exercises back to back, followed by a short rest. Superset is done by performing two exercises back to back, Follow it by a short rest. Typically, the two exercises are opposite muscle groups, such as a pull, followed by a push. Two muscle, opposite muscle groups are going to be performed back to back, done by performing two exercises by, back to back. Supersets are done by performing two exercises back to back, followed it by a short rest. Typically, the two exercises are opposite, mus are opposite muscle groups. The two exercises are opposite muscle groups, such as a pull. Follow it by a push. The two exercises are opposing muscle groups, such as a pull, follow it by a push. And a drop set is going to be advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. The weight is dropped or lowered and, and the exerciser continues until another failure. This can continue for several rounds. So a drop set is going to be an advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. The weight is dropped or, or lowered and the exercise continues until another failure. This can continue for several rounds. The difference between superset and drop set. Superset is going to be two exercises done back to back followed by a short rest. Done by performing two exercises back to back followed by a short rest. Typically, the two exercises are opposing muscles. The two exercises are opposing muscle groups. The two exercises are opposing muscle groups, uh, such as a pull, such as a pull, followed by a push. Followed by a push. Done by performing two exercises back to back, followed by a short rest. It's going to typically the two exercises are opposing muscle groups, uh, such as a pull, such as a pull, followed by a push, such as such as a pull, followed by a push. It's going to be a superset, followed by a push. Now the the drop set is going to be. Now that the drop set is going to be advanced training technique where the drop set is going to be an advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. A drop set is going to be a drop set is going to be an advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. An advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. Drop set is going to be an advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. The, the weight is dropped or lowered and the exerciser continues until another failure. 
This can continue for several rounds. It's going to be a draw set. Advancing technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. The weight is dropped or lowered and the exerciser continues until another failure. It can continue for several rounds. So the difference between a superset and a drop set. Superset is done by performing two exercises back to back, followed by a short rest. Typically, the two exercises are opposite muscle groups, such as a pull, followed by a push. And drop set is advanced training technique where a set is done until failure or fatigue. Uh, the weight is dropped or lowered, and the exerciser continues until another failure. Uh, until another failure. This can be done. This can be not, uh, uh, and this will continue until another failure. This can continue for several rounds. 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 It's going to be a drop set. Exercise selection and technique is going to be chapter 13. Foundations. The nine essential amino acids. <sighs> Lateral pull down works at a lattice in both the door side. Travis Mayor. And then that's list the hamstring and glutes. Okay, I'm going to go over the quiz. It's going to be quiz 11. Force vectors and horizontal and vertical scaling. Never forget about the horizontal and vertical scaling. Horizontal scaling is for people that have time. Vertical scaling is for people that have no time. So concepts of resistance training. What is the metabolic rating equivalent? The, the measure of the ratio, the metabolic equivalent is the measure of the ratio of risk. There is a metabolic equivalent, the measure of the ratio of a person is energy expenditure to the mass. The measure of the ratio of physical activity is going to be in frequency intensity time and type. Include sleep. Calories called of weight loss. It improves sleep. Now, the concept of resistance training. How to hip hinge. There's still no pressure. Uh. All right, brother, let's, let's do the concept of resistance training after a quick break, all right?
force vectors and horizontal and vertical scaling. Force vectors is going to be the force that has both ma magnitude and direction. Force and velocity are in one direction and the speed at which it is moving is, is, is the vector. Force vector is going to be vertical and horizontal loading. Vertical is going to be movements that goes up and down when the body is in an upright position. It has an axial vector. Horizontal is movements where the body is in a line position that goes right and left. Anter anterior posterior vector where the concentric action is, is front to back and post and post posterior vector when the concentric action is back to front. Anterior posterior vector is when the concentric action is front to back and post Post anterior vector is when the concentric action is back to front. The force vector and horizontal and vertical scaling. The force vector is a force that has both magnitude and direction. Force and velocity are in one direction and speed at which it is moving is the vector. The force vector has horizontal and vertical loading. The force vector is going to be a force that has both magnitude and direction. Force and velocity are in one direction and in speed at which it is moving is the vector. The force vectors have vertical and horizontal loading. Vertical is going to be movements that go up and down when the body is in an upright position, an actual vector. Horizontal is going to be... Vertical is movement that goes up and down when the body is in an upright position, or actual vector. Horizontal is movements where the body is in a line position that goes right and left. Anterior-posterior vector is when the concentric action is, in the, is front to back. And post anterior vector is when a concentric action is back to front. Anterior posterior vector is when a concentric action is front to back. And post anterior vector uh, is going to be the when the concentric action is back to front. Now, horizontal and vertical scaling. Vertical scaling is in a set of an exercise followed immediately by a set of a different exercise and uses two or more exercises. Horizontal and vertical scaling. So, vertical scaling is a set of an exercise that is followed immediately by a set of a different exercise and uses two or more exercises. Uh, a lot is going to be a lot like circuit training. It uh, challenges different muscle groups for each set. It's going to be a lot like circuit training. It challenges different muscle groups for each set. It's going to be a lot like circuit training. It challenges different muscle groups for each set. It's going to be a lot like circuit training. And it challenges different muscle groups for each set. A lot like circuit training and it's going to challenge different muscle groups for each set. Horizontal scaling completes one exercise before moving on. Horizontal scaling is going to complete one exercise before moving on. More common approach to exercise, especially in strength training, works the same for works same muscle group until exhaustion. Horizontal scaling completes one exercise before moving on. It's going to be a more common approach to exercise, especially in strength training. It works the same group of muscles. It's going to, grow, it's going to work the same muscle group. Works the same muscle group until exhaustion. Method of training helps clients reach fatigue within one muscle group before moving on to the next. This method of training helps clients reach fatigue within one muscle group before moving on to the next. Horizontal scaling gives clients the freedom to adjust load, tempo, reps, speed, and sets with an exercise. As a trainer, you must decide whether horizontal or vertical scaling is the best for your client. Horizontal scaling gives clients the freedom to adjust load, tempo, reps, speed, and sets within an exercise. And as, as a trainer, you must decide whether horizontal or vertical scaling is best for your client. Lose weight. Vertical scaling increases exercise intensity and maximizes calorie burn. Lose weight. The vertical scaling increases exercise intensity and maximizes calorie burn. Higher heart rate, and more calories that the body burns. Higher heart rate means that the it's going to be the more calories that the body burns. Both is kettle. Higher heart rate is going to be the benefits of uh, vertical scaling. It has a higher heart rate. Higher heart rate is going to be a, a more calories the body burns. A higher heart rate, the more calories the body burns. Higher heart rate, the more calories the body burns. Higher heart rate, the more calories the body burns. Busy scale and short training sessions clients benefit from vertical scaling. Busy schedule, a busy schedule and a shorter training sessions and shorter training sessions clients uh, ben benefits benefits from vertical scaling. 
benefits from vertical scaling. Take less time. It takes less. Take less time. Take less time. Take less time than horizontal scaling. Take less time than horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling is going to be like weight training or bodybuilding. Horizontal scaling like weight training or bodybuilding. Horizontal scaling are going to be examples like weight training or bodybuilding. How to hip hinge. So lose weight. Vertical scaling increases exercise intensity and maximizes the calorie burn. Higher heart rate means that more calories the, born, the body burns. More calories the body burns. Busy schedule and shorter training sessions clients benefits from vertical scaling. Take less time. Vertical scaling take less time than horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling is going to be more for weight training and bodybuilding. Take less time than horizontal scaling and horizontal scaling is going to be for clients that do weight training or bodybuilding. Weight training or bodybuilding. Now in here you have how to hip hinge. How to hip hinge. Fundamental human movement pattern. Difficult movements to teach science that hip joint is the only joint that is supposed to move. How to hip hinge. It's a fundamental human movement pattern. It's a difficult movement to teach science that hip joint is the only joint that is supposed to move. Line should be drawn from the hips through the spine. And a line should be drawn from the hips through the, through the spine and the top of the head. Maintain line as you go forward into the head, into the hinge. You, you should maintain the line as you go further into the hinge. The further the hinge, the more your hips should move. The further the hinge, the more your hips should move throughout your back. The further you hinge, the more your hips should move, should move throughout the back. The deadlifts and the kettlebell swings are going to be examples as examples that require proper hip hinges to perform properly. The further hinge, the more your hips should move, should move throughout the back. Should move throughout the back. Deadlifts th throughout the back. Deadlifts, deadlifts, deadlifts and kettlebell swings. As examples, deadlifts and kettlebell swings as examples that require pro proper hip hinging to perform properly. Deadlifts and kettlebell swings as examples that require proper hip hinging to perform properly. To perform properly. To perform properly. Now, which strength training category is defined as a combination of strength and speed? It's going to be power. So how to hip hinge? It's going to be a fundamental human movement pattern. Difficult movement to teach since the hip joint is the only joint that is supposed to move. Line should be run from the hips to the spine and to the top of the head. And maintain line as you go forward into the hinge. The further you hinge, the more your hips should move throughout the back. This is bad because I'm, my, my spine is, is not... It should not go in a circle because it should go more like this. The further hinge, the more your hips should move. The further hinge, the more your, your hips should move throughout the back. The further hinge, the more your hips should move throughout the back. Should move throughout the back. Now deadlifts and kettlebell swings is going to be examples as examples that require proper hip hinging to perform properly. To perform properly. Now which strength category is defined as a combination of strength and speed? Strength category defined as a combination of strength and speed is going to be power. Power is going to be a combination of strength and speed. The strength category defined as a combination of strength and speed is going to be power. So strength training that it has been found to reduce which resting biological measure? Resting blood pressure. A strength training has been found to reduce which resting biological measure? A strength training has been found to reduce which resting biological measure? It has been found to reduce resting blood pressure. The strength training has been found to reduce which resting metabol which best resting biological measure resting blood pressure. A strength training has been found to reduce which resting biological measure uh, has been found to reduce resting blood pressure. Which strength curve is most, most accurately represented as squatting exercise? A squatting exercise is most closely represented by a, an ascending strength curve. Which strength curve is most accurately represents as squatting exercise? Is going to be an ascending strength curve. The strength curve that is most accurately rep represents a squatting exercise is going to be an ascending strength curve. 
because it is going to be harder when it is at the lowest part. It's going to be the hard, feel the harder when it is at the lowest part. That's the strength curve that is most accurately represented as a squatting exercise. Also, the bench press is going to be an ascending strength curve. What type of foundational exercises promote overall strength and adaptation without necessarily translating to performance or skill development is going to be general exercises. The type of foundational exercises that promote overall strength adaptation without necessarily translating to performance or skill development is going to be general exercise. The type of foundational exercises that promote overall strength adaptation without necessarily translating to performance or skill development is going to be general exercises. The foundational exercises that promote overall strength training adaptations without necessarily translating to performance or skill development is going to be the general exercises. Be general exercises we, we, during a taper. How much should training volume be reduced while exercise intensity remains at or at or above competition maximum level? Thirty to seventy percent reduction in training volume. I want to see what a taper is, dude. What is a taper? Tapering refers to the practice of reducing exercise in the days just before an important competition. In the context of sports, tapering refers to the practice of reducing exercise in the days just before an important competition. Tapering is customary in many endurance sports such as long distance running and swimming. For many athletes, a significant period of tapering is essential for optimal performance. A significant period of tapering is essential for optimal performance. To rest and recuperate, to rest and recuperate energy to fly on race day. To fly on race day. It's going to be tapering. During taper, how much will training volume be reduced while exercise intensity remains at, at or above competition maximum levels? 70 to 30 to 70 percent reduction in training volume. That's going to be for during a taper. How much will training volume be reduced while exercise intensity remains at or above competition maximum levels, 30 to 70% reduction in training volume. It's going to be a 30 to 70% reduction in training volume. In training volume. For resistance training, how is intern intensity represent expressed? For resistance training, for resistance training, how is intensity expressed? Intensity is expressed as a percentage of one repetition max. For resistance training, Intensity is expressed as a percentage of one repetition max. For resistance training, intensity is expressed as a percentage of one repetition max. What training goal is promoted when resistance training is intensity is below 57% of one repetition max, gonna be muscular endurance. Training goal is promoted when exercise intensity, training intensity is below 67% of one RM. It's going to be muscular endurance during exercise intensity. During resistance training, what's variable related to exercise type is gonna be the grip the grip or the breath control to a rate of motion. During, during resistance training, what during resistance training, what subvariable is related to exercise type? It's going to be the grip. Which of the following is an equipment with equipment with variable resistance? The resistance band is going to be an equipment with variable resistance. Which of the following is an equipment with variable resistance? It's going to be the resistance band. An equipment with variable resistance is going to be a resistance band. And which of the following is an example of a static resistance exercise? An example of a static resistance exercise is going to be the plank. The plank because you're statically resisting the force of gravity it's going to, and you're working on your core. That's why it's, the, it's an example of a static resistance exercise because you're not moving and you're working in the balance of the plank. Another one could be like standing on one foot like this. And how long can you last? Because you're working on your balance. And like, how stable can you be? It's working on your balance. For the left and for the right, the plank. An example of a static resistance exercise is going to be the plank. An example of a static resistance exercise is going to be the plank. The plank is a static resistance exercise, a, a plank. The plank, and that's, that was it for, 
for the chapter of resistance training. So how to hip hinge is going to be fundamental human movement, pattern, difficult movement to teach since the hip is the joint is the only joint that is supposed to move. Line should be drawn from the hips through the spine and the top of the head. Maintain line as you go further into the hinge. The further you hinge, the more your hips should move throughout the back. Deadly and kettlebell swings are examples that require proper hinging to perform properly. How to hip hinge, fundamental movement pattern. A difficult movement to teach since the hip joint is the only joint that is supposed to move. Line should be drawn from the hips through the spine and top of the head. A maintain line as you go further into the hinge. A maintain line as you go further into the hinge. Now, the further you hinge, the more your hips should move throughout, your, throughout the back. The further you hinge, the more your hips should move throughout the back. The further you hinge, the more your hips should move throughout the back. And the deadlifts and kettlebell swings are examples of the required proper hip hinging. Uh, that the further you hinge, the more your hips should move throughout the back. And, and the deadlifts and kettlebell swings are examples uh, examples that require a proper hip hinging to perform properly, also the, the Romanian deadlift. They require proper hip hinging to perform properly. Proper hip hinging to perform properly. To perform properly. Which training categories define as a combination of strength and speed is going to be power? Strength training has been found to reduce which resting biological measure that resting blood pressure. Which resting biological measure is going to be strength training? Is going to be resting blood pressure. Found to reduce which resting biological measure? Resting blood pressure. Wh which ascending resting blood pressure? Which strength curve is most is most accurately associated represents as squatting exercises? Which strength curve most accurately represents as squatting exercise? Ascending strength curve most accurately represents as squatting exercise. Now, what type of foundational exercise promotes the overall strength adaptation without necessarily translating to performance or skill development? It's going to be general exercise. It's going to be a type of foundational exercise that promotes overall strength adaptations without necessarily translating to performance or skill development. It's going to be the general exercises. Promotes overall strength adaptations without necessarily translating to performance or skill development. It's going to be the general exercises. During a taper, how much will training volume be reduced while exercise intensity remains? Uh, at or above competition maximum levels, training volume should be reduced to 30 to 70 percent reduction in training volume during a taper. How much will training volume be reduced while exercise intensity remains at or above competition maximum levels? 30 to 70 percent reduction in training volume. Now, for resistance training, how is intensity expressed? Now, for resistance training, for resistance training, how is intensity expressed? Intensity is going to be expressed as a percentage of one repetition max. For resistance training, how is intensity expressed as a percentage of one repetition max? That's how intensity is going to be expressed as a percentage of one repetition max. Now, what training goal is promoting when resistance training intensity below 67% of one repetition max? Muscular endurance. Training goal that is promoted when resistance training intensity is below 77 Training goal promoted when resistance training is intensity is below 67% of one repetition max is going to be muscular endurance. Muscular endurance. Muscular endurance. During resistance training, what sub-variable is related to exercise type is going to be the grip. During resistance training, what sub-variable is related to exercise type is going to be the hand grip or also the breath control. Hand grip or breath control. To the range of motion. Hand placement too. The grip. The variable related to exercise type is going to be the grip. Which of the following is which of the following is equipment with variable resistance is going to be resistance band. Which of the following is equipment with variable resistance? Equipment with variable resistance is going to be resistance band. And finally, which of the following is an example of a resistance uh, of study resistance exercise is going to be the plank. Which of the following is an example of a study resistance exercise is going to be the plank. Which of the following is an example of a study resistance exercise? It's going to be the plank. It's going to be an example of a static resistance exercise. It's going to be the plank, the plank, the plank. Page 420. The plank. Now, exercise selection and, and te uh, exercise selection and technique. 
the plank, my friends. Exercise selection and technique is going to be quiz 12. Uh, how long? It's been 120 minutes and I have not taken a break yet. That's crazy. I'll take a break right now. Exercise selection and technique. It's a little bit more complex. This is why for exercise selection and technique, I'm going to actually go over a, a little bit more examples because you have six movement categories. You have six fundamental movement categories and two additional exercise categories. That's hinge, push, pull, squat, launch, and locomotion. So yeah, we're gonna go over it in a bit. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath first, dude. Let's get it. Il atardecer de mi casa. Exercise selection and technique. It's gonna be fifteen percent of your grade, bro. Let's get it. Chapter fourteen. Chapter fourteen. And after that is nutrition and supplementation, which is ten percent of your grade. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck sake, it's like fourteen questions, bro. A max of fourteen questions for exam, bro. I'm tinkering. That was a lot of information. I love it.
It's a way to spend my break. Taking out the trash. Literally taking out the trash. Exercise selection and techniques. Let's get it. Exercise selection and technique. Yes. Look at that shit, bro. Selection and, and uh, exercise selection and technique. That's crazy. All right, we're going to start with exercise selection and technique and continue my studies for this amazing certification. As you can see, exercise selection and technique is going to be 15% of your grade in the NCC PCC Candidates Handbook for uh, exercise selection and technique and training instruction. You have corrective technique. Educate client technique regard regarding technique and form, like coaching cues, correct technique on kinetic chain checkpoints, correct posture, use variable and non-verbal cues, and corrective muscular imbalances, and incorrect posture and technique. And correct cor for corrective technique and for monitor client, you have to evaluate client's progress in multiple measures like the energy level, sleep quality, changes in appearance and measurements. Apply coaching cues to evaluate client's technique and form like range of motion, intensity, speed, and symmetry. Inform the client regarding recovery, rest, uh, overtraining, and when to stop exercising. And monitor and modify intensity during cardiovascular activity based on the client's physical abilities. Monitor and modify intensity during cardiovascular activity based on the client's physical ability. Based on the client's physical abilities. It's going to be for the monitor client. So let's get it. Exercise selection and technique. Three different learning styles, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. So exercise selection and technique. Let's look at the terms for exercise selection and technique. For exercise and selection and technique, you have uh, terms like the cooing, three different learning styles, which are gonna be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. Visual, verbal, and kinesthetic cueing. Exercise progression and regression. Exercise progression versus exercise regression. Now you have Six fundamental movement categories, which are hinge, push, pull, squat, lunge, and locomotion. And two additional exercise categories, which are going to be core training and, and isolation and activation exercises. Core training and isolation and activation exercises. So the learning objective for the exercise lesson and technique, you're going to have six learning objectives this time. Defra describe the three different learning, learning styles. Describe that three different learning styles. It's going to be one of the learning objectives is going to be to describe the three learning styles. The three different learning styles, which are going to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. The three different learning styles. Define verbal and nonverbal communication and how a fitness professional uses both. You have to define what is verbal and nonverbal communication and how a fitness professional uses both. Explain exercise cueing and its importance in exercise and fitness. Explain exercise cueing, ability to direct movements with clarity and precision. It's going to be cueing, the ability to direct movements with, cl with clarity and precision, and its importance in exercise and fitness. Exercise cueing and its importance in exercise and fitness. Identify the fundamental movement categories that classify human movement. Identify the fundamental movement categories that classify human movement. List exercises applicable to each fundamental movement categories. List exercises applicable to each fundamental movement category. Identify the prime movers for each exercise presented. The prime movers, the agonists and the antagonists for each exercise presented. So it's going to be separated into two sessions of free the learning styles. You find the free. <laughs> Describe the three different learning styles, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. The three different learning styles. Describe the three different learning styles. Define styles. De define verbal and nonverbal communication. You have to define verbal and nonverbal communication. And how a fitness professional uses both. Define verbal and nonverbal communication. And how a fitness professional uses both. You have to define verbal and nonverbal communication. And how a fitness professional uses both. Explain exercise cooing 
and its importance in exercise and fitness. Identify the fundamental movement categories that clarify human movement. Exercise cueing and its importance in exercise and fitness. Identify the fundamental movement categories that classify human movement. Now, list exercises applicable to each fundamental movement category. List exercises applicable to each fundamental movement category and identify the prime movers for each exercise presented. Cooing is going to be the ability to direct movement and clarify precision. It's going to be cooing. Uh, cueing is going to be the ability to direct movements with clarity and precision. Ability to direct movements with clarity and precision. That's going to be cueing. It's important in exercise and fitness. Cueing is going to be the ability to direct movements. The ability to direct movements with clarity and, pre and precision. It's going to be cueing. The ability to direct movements with clarity and precision. Three different learning styles. You have the three different learning styles, which are going to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. Visual, they're going to learn best through seeing information that is being taught. Uh, through seeing the information that is being taught, includes reading the text, looking at the pictures or diagrams, uh, or watching someone demonstrate a movement. They're going to be visual. Includes reading a text, Looking at the pictures or diagrams or watching someone demonstrate a movement. Demonstrate a, a movement. Now, the auditory learners, the auditory learners prefers to learn by hearing instructions, rely on both speaking and hearing to process information. Learners often like to repeat information back. Auditory, they're going to prefer to learn by hearing instructions. You're going to hear instructions refers to learn by hearing instructions. Rely on both speaking and hearing to process information. Learners often like to repeat information back. So the auditory learners prefer to learn by hearing instructions. Rely on both speaking and hearing to process information. Learners often like to repeat information back. Auditory prefers to learn by hearing instructions. Rely on both speaking and hearing to process information. Learners often like to repeat information back. And kinesthetic learns best through movement and hands-on activities. Kinesthetic learners learn best through movements and hands-off activities. Learners often like to repeat information back. And kinesthetic learners learn best through movement and hands-on activities. Kinesthetic learners learn best through movements and hands-on activities. Responds better to physical touch than verbal instructions and rely on the sense of sense of touch, smell, and taste in the learning experience. You know, learners learn best from movement and hands-on activities. Respond better to physical touch than verbal instructions and rely on the senses of touch, smell, and taste in the learning experience. Now you have cueing. That's going to be the three different learning styles. It's going to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. Cueing is going to be the ability to direct movements with clarity and precision. The ability to direct movements with clarity and precision. So now you have visual cueing. Visual cueing, visual learners learn best by seeing what is being taught. Visual learners learn best by seeing what is being taught. Clear and concise movements best serve those who learn visually. Visual cueing, visual learners learn best by seeing what is being taught. Clear and concise movements best serve those who learn visually. Verbal cueing, auditory learners learn best by listening to verbal cues. Uh, so seeing ver verbal feedback to clients reinforces correct movement patterns. So sent verbal feedback to clients reinforces uh, correct movement patterns. And finally, kinesthetic learners, kinesthetic cueing is going to be the for kinesthetic learners absorb instruction best through hands-on learning. Kinesthetic learners absorb instruction best through hands-on learning. Physical cueing, uh, learning. Physical cueing can be effective. The physical cueing can be effective, particularly for new clients, as it helps them develop kinesthetic awareness. Always get the consent. Always get client consent to touch them, and the touch cannot be overly aggressive. It's going to be kinesthetic cueing. Kinesthetic learners absorb interaction best through hands-on learning. Physical cueing can be effective, particularly for new clients, 
as it helps them develop as it helps them develop kinesthetic awareness. Always get the client's consent to touch them. Always get the consent of the client to touch them. And the touch cannot be overly aggressive. The touch cannot be overly aggressive. The touch cannot be overly aggressive. Cannot be overly aggressive. The touch cannot be overly ag aggressive. Cannot be overly aggressive. Yeah. That's going to be for describe the three different learning styles, define variable, normal communication, and how fitness professionals use both. And as both, and explain exercise queuing and its importance in exercise and fitness. Explain exercise queuing and its, and its importance in exercise and fitness. Identify the movement, identify the fundamental movement categories that clarify human, human movement. This exercise is applicable to each fundamental movement category. This exercise will be called to each fundamental movement category and identify the prime movers for each exercise present. Presented. Queuing is going to be the ability to rate movements with clarity and precision. Ability to rate movements with clarity and precision. And three different learning styles are going to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. Yeah. Now you have the movement categories. You have six fundamental movement categories. Six fundamental movement categories. You have the hinge, a forward and backward movement of the upper body, while, while the, a forward and ba a backward movement of the upper body while the hips remain at the same height and move back. The prime mover is going to be the gluteus maximus at the hip, with some strong help from the hamstring group. Also strengthen the erector spinae, as they will be isometrically acting to maintain the neural span to maintain the neutral spine position. Example is going to be a, rom a dumbbell Romanian deadlift. So you have six fundamental movement categories. You have the hinge. It's going to be a forward and backward movement of the upper body while the hips remain at the same height and move back. The prime mover is going to be the gluteus maximus at the hip. The prime mover is going to be the gluteus maximus at the hip with some strong help from the hamstring groups. Also strength and strengthen the erector spinae as they will be isometrically acting to maintain the neural, as they will be isometrically acting to maintain the neutral, the neutral spine position, the neutral spine position. Example of this, the neutral spine position. An example of this is going to be that dumbbell. An example of this is going to be that dumbbell Romanian deadlift. An example is going to be the dumbbell Romanian deadlift. Dumbbell Romanian deadlift. Now, push is going to be upper body exercises in which the arms themselves or the arms and the tool directed by the arms move away from the body. Primary joints involved is going to be the, the, you know, the glenohumeral joint. The joints involved is going to be the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder. The shoulder is going to be the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder and the elbow joints. Pushing can happen vertically overhead or horizontally, anteriorly, and everything in between. And everything in between. An example is going to be a dumbbell chest press. Pushing can happen vertically overhead or horizontally, anteriorly, and everything in between. Uh, and, and everything in between. Uh, an example is going to be the dumbbell chest press. The dumbbell chest press. Now, the pull is going to be upper body exercise in which the arms or, or the arms. And pull is going to be an upper body exercises in which the arms or the arms and a tool directed by the arms are moved closer to the body. Upper body exercises in which the arms or the arms and a tool directed by the arms are moved closer to the body. Primary joints involved are going to be the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder and the elbow joint. Pulling can happen vertically overhead, horizontally, anteriorly, and everything in between. Lateral pull, then, is going to be an example of a pull. Upper body exercises in which the arms or the arms and a tool directed by the arms move closer to the body, are moved closer to the body. Primary joints involved is going to be the the primary joints involved is going to be the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder, and the elbow joint. Pulling can happen vertically overhead, or horizontally, anteriorly, and everything in between. An example is going to be a lateral pull down. An example is going to be a lateral pull down. Now the squat is going to be a level change lateral pull down. It's going to be an example. Example is going to be a lateral pull down. And a squat is going to be a level change movement in which the person goes from a standing position to a lower position by bending at the hips, knees, and ankles. Uh, a level a squat is going to be a level change movement in which a person goes from a standing position to a lower position by bending the hips, the knees, the knees, 
by bending at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. Primary joint movers are going to be, the primary joints involved is going to be the hip, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. The prime movers at, at the hips will be the, the prime mover at the hip will be the gluteus maximus, and at the knees is going to be the quadriceps. Example is going to be a goblet squat. At the hips is going to be the gluteus maximus, and at the knees is going to be the quadriceps. So, uh, example is going to be a goblet squat. A squat is going to be a level change movement in which a person goes from a standing position to a lower position by bending at, at the hips. In which a person goes from a standing position to a lower position by bending at the hips, knees, and ankles. Primary joint mover uh, and ankles. The primary joints involved are going to be the hip, the knee, and the ankle. The prime movers at the hips are going to be the gluteus maximus and at the knees are going to be the quadriceps. Example is going to be a goblet squat. A launch is a step and return movement. Primary joints involved is going to be the hip, knee, and ankle joints. A step and return movement is going to be a launch. A step and return movement. The primary joints involved are going to be the hip, the knees, and the ankle joints. The prime movers at the hips will be the gluteus maximus and at the knees will be the quadriceps as well. A, a launch example. Launch example is going to be a dumbbell forward launch. Launch example is going to be a dumbbell forward launch. It's going to be a launch example. A dumbbell forward launch. And locomotion is going to be a broad term referring to the ability to move from one place to another. Locomotion is going to be a broad term. Uh, locomotion is going to be a broad term referring to the ability to move from one place to another using the limbs. A broad term referring to the ability to move. A locomotion, a broad term referring to the ability, a broad term referring to the ability to move from one place to another using the limbs. Example is going to be walking, running, skipping, swimming, and crawling. This course will focus on bi. This course will focus on bipedal locomotion. This course will focus on bipedal locomotion or movement done on two feet. Doing bipedal locomotion. During bipedal locomotion, the primary joints involved. During bipedal locomotion, during bipedal locomotion, the primary joints involved will be the hips, the knees, and the ankles. During bipedal locomotion, the primary joints involved, the primary joints involved will be the hips, the knees, and the ankles. Example is going to be farmer's carry. Farmer's carry. Shoulders need to be extended to prevent feet from collapsing inwards. Example is going to be farmer's carry, and the shoulders need to be extended to prevent feet from collapsing inwards. Example of this locomotion exercise is going to be the farmer carry, and the shoulders need to be extended to prevent feet from collapsing inwards. Example is going to be farmer's carry. The shoulders need to be extended. The shoulders need to be extended to prevent feet from collapsing inwards. The shoulders need to be extended to prevent the feet from collapsing inwards. Now, two additional exercises categories are going to be the, the two additional, the shoulders need to be extended to prevent feet from collapsing inwards. Now, two additional exercises categories are going to be the core. Two additional exercises categories are going to be the core. It specifically help to train the muscles of the pelvis, lower back, hips, and abdomen. Contributes to overall strength, power production, balance, and stability. And lowering the incidence of and lowers the incidence of lower of low back pain. Example is going to be abdominal crunch and plank. So it's going to be core exercises. Two additional exercise categories are going to be the core exercises. Core training specifically help to train the muscles of the pelvis, the lower back, the hips, and the abdomen. Help to train the muscles of the pelvis, the lower back, the hips, and the abdomen. Contributes to the overall strength, power production, balance, and stability and lowers the incidence of low back pain. Example is going to be abdominal crunch and planks. So the core is going to specifically help to train the muscles of the pelvis, the lower back, the hips, and the abdomen. It contributes to the overall strength, power production, balance, and stability, and lowers the incidence of low back pain, and lowers the incidence of low back pain, of low back pain. The example is going to be abdominal crunch and planks. And finally, isolation and activation exercises. Isolation exercises typically single joint movements that can be used to add stress to specific areas of the body to promote to, of the body to promote hypertrophy, like muscle growth. And activation exercises typically low intensity exercises uh, and can be used as part of a specific warm up. 
or as part of a corrective exercise program, you said to improve muscular imbalances. Example is going to be the table triceps extension. So it's going to be isolation and activation exercises. Isolation exercises typically single joint movements that can be used to add stress to specific areas of the body uh, to promote hypertrophy muscle growth. And activation exercises are going to be typically low intensity exercises that can be used as as part of a specific warm-up or as part of a corrective exercise program, use it to improve, use it to improve, to improve muscular imbalances. Use it to improve muscular imbalances. Use it to improve muscular imbalances. Example is going to be that cable trusses extension. Use it to improve muscular imbalances. Example is going to be the cable triceps extension. Example is going to be the cable triceps extension. Now, exercise progression and regression. Exercise progression and regression. Progressions, modifications to acute training variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern. And regressions is going to be modifications of acute training variables that decreases the challenge of a movement pattern. Progression, modifications to acute training variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern. And regression is a modification to acute training variables that decreases the challenge of a movement pattern. Two additional core exercises. Two additional exercises category is going to be core to really help to train the muscles of the pelvis the lower back, the hips, and the abdomen uh, contributes to role strength, power production, balance, and stability, and lowers the incidence of low back pain. Now, that's going to be an example. An example is going to be abdominal crunches. Example is going to be abdominal crunch and planks. Example is going to be abdominal crunches, abdominal crunches and planks. And isolation and activation exercises. Isolation exercises are going to be typically single joint movements that can be used to add stress to specific areas of the body to promote hypertrophy, muscle growth. An activation exercise is typically low intensity exercises and can be used as part of a specific warm up or as part of a corrective exercise program. Use it to improve muscular imbalances. Used to improve, used to improve muscular imbalances. To improve muscular imbalances. Example, muscular imbalances. Example are going to be cable triceps extension muscular imbalances. Example is going to be cable triceps extension. In here you have example is going to be cable triceps extension. Video. Exercise ex sorry. Example is going to be the cable triceps extension. Exercise progression and regression. Progression is modification to, to, to acute training variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern. And regression is going to be modifications to acute training variables that decrease the challenge of a movement pattern. And the power is going to be a combination of strength and speed. Power is going to be a combination of strength and speed. It's going to be power. A combination of strength and speed is going to be power. CPT module 8 notes is going to be for nutrition foundations and supplementation. Now in here, you are going to see now the corrective techniques and the monitor clients for the exam of Facebook Legend and training extraction, 15%. Provision is my vision to keep doing only piece of chunk of power.
Period. Exercise progression and regression. Exercise progression modifications to acute training variables that increase the challenge of a movement pattern and regression is the modifications to acute training variables that decrease the challenge of a movement pattern. And power is a combination of strength and speed. Power is going to be a combination of strength and speed. In here, now the exercise selection and technique. A combination of strength and speed is going to be power. Exercise progression and regression. Exercise progression and regression. Progression is going to be modifications to a given running variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern. And regression is going to be modifications to a given running variables that decreases the challenge of a movement pattern. And power is going to be a combination of strength and speed. Power is a combination of strength and speed. That's going to be power. A combination of strength and speed. Power is a combination of strength and speed. Period. That's it, bro. Power is a combination of strength and speed. Period. And that's it, bro. Good foundations. So exercise selection and technique. Exercise progression and exercise regression. Exercise progression is the modification to acute training variables that increase the challenge of a movement pattern, while exercise regression is the modification to acute training variables that decrease the challenge of a movement pattern. For example, adding weight to a movement to progress it or removing weight from the exercise to, to regress it. Variables that can be manipulated to create the variables that can be manipulated to create a progression or regression include a load, include the load, the weight, the tempo, the speed. The range of motion, the movement complexity, and then or not or the novelty. What is the novelty? We're gonna see. Competition. Encourages neuroplasticity, or its ability to make a new neural pathways in response to stimulus. Novelty original initial new stimulus encourages neuroplasticity, or brain's ability to make new neural pathways in response to the stimulus. The stimulus. of 170 pounds. Exercise progression and exercise regression. Exercise progression is a modification to acute training variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern, while exercise regression is a modification to acute training variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern. Of a movement pattern. For example, adding weight... For example, adding weight to a variable... For example, for example, adding weight to a movement to progress it, for example, adding weight to a movement to progress it or removing weight from the exercise to regress it. Variables adding weight to a movement to progress it or removing weight from the exercise to regress it. Variables that can be manipulated, adding weight to a movement to progress it or removing weight from the exercise to regress it. Uh, variables that can be to regress it. 
adding weight to a movement to progress it, or removing weight from the exercise to regress it. Now, the variables that can be manipulated to regress it. The variables that can be manipulated to create a progression or regression include a load. The variables that can be manipulated uh, to create a progression or regression include the load, the weight, the tempo, the speed, the range of motion, the movement complexity, the movement complexity, or the novelty. The movement complexity or the, or the novelty. Or the novelty. Or the novelty. Now, name the three different learning styles. We have three different learning styles. Name the three different learning styles. We have visual learning, auditory learning, and kinesthetic learning. Explain how each learning style best learns information. 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 As part a vital part of becoming a successful personal trainer is the ability to instruct effectively in each of the three forms, visually, auditory, and kinesthetic. Each form corresponds with the way people communicate and the way they learn. A vital part of becoming a successful personal trainer is the ability to instruct effectively in each of the three forms, visually, auditory, and kinesthetic. Each form corresponds with the way people communicate and the way they learn. Visual learners tend to process information quickly, use descriptive language, and are prone to using hand gestures. They learn best through seeing information being taught. This could include reading text, looking at pictures or diagrams, or watching someone demonstrate a movement. Auditory learners prefer to learn by hearing instructions. They do best by listening and relying on both speaking and hearing to process information. Auditory learners often like to repeat information back to ensure they understand the, of a concept, the understanding of a concept or a movement. Kinesthetic learners learn best through movement on hands on activity. They can be slower to process information and respond better to physical touch and verbal instruction. They prefer being active when learning and rely on the sense of touch, smell, and taste in the learning experience. Effective trainers remain aware of all three types of learners. This includes learning different types of instruction to better relate to clients in their language. Cueing is an important part of personal training. Cueing is the ability to cue with clarity and precision, plays a huge role in each of the client's movements and overall success. The three different learning styles are going to be visual learning, auditory learning, and kinesthetic learning. Explain how each, le each learning style is best. It should include load, the weight, tempo, the speed, the range of motion, the, com the, move the range of motion, the movement complexity, and the or the novelty. Name the three different learning styles, the visual learners, the auditory learners, the kinesthetic learners. Explain how each learning style best uh, learns information, best learns information. A vital part of becoming a successful personal trainer is the ability to instruct effectively. A vital part of becoming a successful personal trainer is the ability to instruct effectively in each of the three forms. Visually, visually, auditory, and kinesthetic. Each form corresponds with the way people communicate and the way they learn. Each form corresponds with the way that people communicate and the way they learn. The vital explain how each learning style best learns information. A vital part of becoming a successful personal trainer is the ability to instruct effectively in each of the three forms, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Each form corresponds with the way people communicate and the way they learn. Visual learners tend to process information quickly, use descriptive language, and are prone to using hand gestures. They learn best through seeing information being taught. This could include reading text, looking at pictures or diagrams, or watching some movement. Explain how, each best, explain how each learning style best learns information. how each learning style best learns information. A vital part of becoming a successful personal trainer is the ability to instruct effectively in each of the three forms. It's going to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Each form corresponds with the way people communicate and the way they learn. Visual learners tend to process information quickly, use descriptive language, and are prone to using hand gestures. They learn best 
through seeing the information being taught. This could include reading text, uh, looking at pictures or diagrams, or watching someone demonstrate a movement. Auditory learners prefer to learn by hearing instructions. Auditory learners prefer to learn. Auditory learners. Auditory learners prefer to learn by hearing instructions. They do best by listening and rely on both speaking and hearing to process information. Auditory learners often like to repeat information back to ensure their understanding of a concept uh, or movement. Auditory learners prefer to learn by hearing instructions. They do best by listening and rely on both speaking and hearing to process information. Uh, auditory learners often like to repeat information back to ensure uh, their understanding of a concept of movement. To ensure their understanding of a concept or movement. Or movement. Kinesthetic learners learn best through movements. And hands on activities. Uh, they, they can be slower to process information and respond better to physical touch and verbal instruction. They prefer being active when learning and rely on the sense and rely on the senses of touch, smell, and taste in the learning experience. Effective trainers remain aware of all free learning in the learning experience. Uh, effective trainers. Effective trainers remain aware of all three types of learners in the learning experience. Effective trainers, effective experience, effective trainers remain aware of all three types of learners. Effective trainers remain aware of all three types of learners. Effective trainers remain aware of all three types of learners. They, this includes uh, learning different types of instruction to better relate to clients in their language. Cueing in their language. In their language. Uh, cueing is an important part of personal training. The ability to cue with clarity and precision plays a huge role in each client's movements, in each of the client's movements, in each of the client's movements and overall success. Cueing is an important part of personal training. It's a, the, 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 uh, the ability to cue with clarity and precision plays a huge role in each client's movements in each client's movements, an overall success, an overall success, an overall success, an overall success, period, an overall success, period. An overall success. Name the six movement categories and again an example of an exercise for each category. Name the six movement categories and give an example of an exercise for each category. Name the six movement categories and give an example of an exercise for each category. For the hinge, hip hinge, a forward and backward movement of the upper body while the hips remain at the same height and move back. An example is going to be the barbell deadlift, which is going to be an upper body exercises in which the arms themselves or the arms and a tool directed by the arms move away from the body. An example is going to be barbell bench press. Pull is going to be pulling movements uh, are upper body exercises. Pulling movements are upper body exercises in which the arms or the arms are totally directed by the arms are moved closer to the body. An example is going to be a seated cable row. A seated cable row. A squat is going to be the squat is level change movement in which a person goes from a standing position to a lower, a level change movement in which a person goes from a standing position to a lower position by bending at the hips, knees, and ankles. An example is going to be a barbell bench squat. 
in ankles. An example is going to be a barbell back squat. An example is going to be a barbell back squat. A barbell back squats. Barbell back squats. Lunge is going to be a step and return movement. In other words, from a stationary position, a person steps in any direction with one leg while the other remains stationary and then returns to the starting position. Example is going to be dumbbell forward lunge. Lunge is going to be a step and return movement. In other words, uh, from a stationary position, a person steps in any direction with one leg while the other remains stationary and then returns to the starting position. To the starting position. An example is going to be a dumbbell forward lunge. An example is going to be a dumbbell forward lunge. And finally, a locomotion is the ability to move from one place to another using the limbs. Focus is bipedal, like a farmer's carry. Locomotion is going to be the ability to move from one place to another using the limbs. Focus is bipedal. Example is going to be farmer's carry. Locomotion is the ability to move from one place to another using the limbs. The, the focus is bipedal which is means you use the both feet. The farmer's carry is an example. Locomotion is the ability to move from one place to another using the limbs. The focus is going to be bipedal. An example is going to be farmer's carry. Farmer carry. Farmer carry. Yeah. Locomotion. Uh, so what exercises is shown in the images above? What exercises are shown in the images above is going to be a dumbbell Romanian deadlift. A dumbbell Romanian deadlift. When you go from this, to this, and you try to focus on the on the hips joints, and that sh and everything else remains up upright, down and up, down and up, and you try not not to curve. You try not to curve the spine. It's gonna be a dumbbell Romanian deadlift. You need to remain upright. The dumbbell Romanian deadlift half focuses on the hamstrings and the glutes. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the hamstrings and the glutes. Another, uh, an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in these exercises for the prime movers, and an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be kettlebell swings and dumbbell single leg Romanian deadlift. The barbell. What exercise is shown in the images above? This is going to be a dumbbell Romanian deadlift. The what is are the prime movers in for this exercise is going to be the hamstrings and the glutes. Name an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise. An alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise are going to be the kettlebell swings and the dumbbell single leg uh, Romanian deadlift. The kettlebell swings and the dumbbell single leg Romanian deadlifts. Uh, novel or novelty. So an exercise shown in the images above the dumbbell Romanian deadlift, the prime movers for research is going to be the hamstrings and the glutes. An alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in these exercises are going to are going to be an alternative exercises for the prime movers involved in this exercise are going to be the kettlebell swings and the dumbbell single leg Romanian deadlift. The kettlebell swings. The kettlebell swings is going to do a hinge movement and the dumbbell single leg Romanian deadlift. The dumbbell single leg Romanian deadlift right here. Bro. Dumbbell Romanian deadlift, hamstrings and glutes. The alternative exercise is going to be the kettlebell swings and the dumbbell single leg Romanian deadlift. Now, exercise shown in the images above is going to be the dumbbell chest press. The dumbbell chest press, which is going to be an. It, it, it's going to be from up here and it's going to go to abduct in the frontal plane. An abduction of the frontal plane. Dumbbell chest press. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the pectoralis major. And the alternative exercises for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the barbell bench press, a standing cable chest press, and the push ups.
It's going to be horizontal, dumbbell chest press. The prime movers in the exercise is going to be the pectoralis major, it's at 45 degrees. And alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be uh, the, the barbell in this exercise is going to be the barbell bench press, the standing cable chest press, and the push ups. The barbell bench press, the standing cable chest press, and the push ups. Now, the lateral pull down, the exercise shown in the images above is going to be the lateral pull down, the lateral pull down. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the latissimus dorsi is going to be the prime movers for this exercise. The latissimus dorsi is going to be the prime mover for the lateral pull down. The latissimus dorsi. And alternative exercises for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the pull ups and the seated, the seated cable rows. The pull up and the seated cable rows, which works the latissimus dorsi, the rhombus, and frappinatus. The trapezius, the third minor, the posterior delta, the third major, the ranchalis, lower spectralis, my branches, branch is flow head. I'm gonna work the, the posterior muscles. Exercise is shown in the images above, is going to be the lateral pull down. Infraspinatus, latissimus dorsi. Sternal oblique stress major, minor teres major. Latissimus dorsi. And conius. Gracilis, the gastronimius and the soleus. Semitendinosus, semimembranosus, biceps femoris, gracilis, vastus lateralis, gluteus maximus, abdor, ab so the lateral pull down, the prime mover of the lateral pull down is going to be the latissimus dorsi. The, the prime mover of the lateral pull down is going to be the latissimus dorsi. An alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the pull ups and the seated cable row. It's going to be horizontal. Now, in here, this is going to be an isolation activation exercise. It's going to be an isolation exercise, which is going to work in leg extension. This is the leg extension right here. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be the leg extension. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be the leg extension. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the quadriceps. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the dumbbell walking and forward lunge and leg press. Dumbbell walking and forward lunge and the leg press. It's going to be for leg extension. It's going to be an isolation exercise that only works in the quadriceps. Leg extension. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be the leg extension. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the quadriceps. The quadriceps muscle is going to be the prime movers for this exercise. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise. Alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise are going to be the dumbbell walking and forward lunge and the leg press. Dumbbell walking and forward lunge. The dumbbell walking and forward lunge and the bench press. The bench, the, the leg press, sorry, the leg press. The leg press right here. It also works the quadriceps. The leg extension works the quadriceps. As a prime movers and an alternative exercise for the prime movers involving this exercise is going to be the dumbbell walking and forward lunge and the leg press. Yeah. Now this is going to be a machine assisted dips that works in the triceps branches. The machine assisted dips, the prime movers for the machine assisted dips is going to be the triceps branchy. The triceps branchy is going to be the main muscle that are working the machine assisted dips. In the, in the exercise showing the images above is going to be the machine assisted dips. And the prime movers for this exercise is going to be the triceps branchy. Alternative exercises for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the cable row extension, the cable row extension, and the, by, and the bench dips. The cable row extension, which is going to be this one right here, that works in the works the triceps and the bench dips. 
the bench dips right here. The bench dips. The words in the triceps branch. Exercise shown, the exercise shown in the images above is going to be the machine assisted dips. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be the machine assisted dips. The prime movers in this exercise is going to be the triceps branchy. And the alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise. Alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise are going to be the cable row extension, the cable row extension, and the bench dips. The cable row extension and the bench dips. The cable row extension and the bench dips. Now in here you have the exercise shown in the image above is going to be the upright row. The upright row exercise that works in the deltoids. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be the upright row, upright row that works in the deltoids. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be the upright row, and that and the prime movers for this exercise is going to be the deltoids. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the dumbbell seated overhead press. The dumbbell seated overhead press, which is going to do like this. The dumbbell seated over overhead press. And the machine seated overhead press right here. The dumbbell seated overhead press that works in the deltoids. It works in the, the deltoid muscles, in the lateral deltoids, and the serratus anterior. Anterior deltoid, lateral deltoids. So the, the exercise shown in the images above is going to be the upright row. The exercise is shown in the images above is going to be the upright row. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the deltoids. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the dumbbell seated overhead press. The dumbbell seated overhead press. And this is finally the last one is going to be the shown in the images above is going to be the dumbbell split squats. And it works in the quadriceps and the glutes. The exercises shown in the images above is going to be a lunge or a dumbbell split squat. The exercise shown in the images above is going to be a dumbbell split squat. Exercises shown in the images above is going to be the dumbbell split squats. The prime movers for this exercise is going to be the quadriceps and the gluteus maximus. The prime movers for the exercise is going to be the quadriceps and the gluteus maximus. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the seated and angular leg press and the barbell back and goblet squat. The barbell back squat and the goblet squat. The goblet squat. So exercises is shown in the images above is going to be the dumbbell split squat. The prime movers for this exercise are going to be the quadriceps and the glutes. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the seated and angular, be uh, the seated and angular leg press. The seated and, ang and angled leg press. And the barbell back and goblet squats. The alternative exercises for the prime movers involved in this exercise is going to be the seated and angled leg press. And the barbell back and goblet squats for the dumbbell split squats. The exercise shown below is going to be the, the dumbbell split squats. And the prime movers is going to be the quadriceps and the glutes. And an alternative exercise for the prime movers involved in this exercise are going to be the seated and angled leg press and the barbell back and goblet squats. The seated and angled leg press and the barbell back and goblet squats. Yeah. And that's it, bro, for uh, exercise selection. And technique and now you're gonna go over nutrition and foundations nutrition foundations nutrition foundations now you go over the, the quiz right here for quiz 12 exercise selection and technique what is exercise progression it's going to be more efficient to acute training variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern body language spatial relations and parallel language are examples of what type of communication body language spatial relations and parallel language are examples of non-verbal communications uh, Non-verbal communication. Now, uh, uh, what type of learner learns best when they can see the information being tough? When they can see the information being tough, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's going to be visual learners. Which of the following is advice when giving verbal cues to increase client understanding? You simplify language. So the following is advice when giving verbal cues. To increase client's understanding is going to be to use simplified language. 
you need to use simplified language when using the following is which of the following is advised when given verbal cues to increase the client's understanding you need to use to increase the client understanding you need to use simplified simplified you need to use simplified simplified language you need you need to use simplified language now which of the following exercises is categorized which of the following exercises is categorized as a hinge movement? A deadlift is going to be a hinge movement. Which of the following exercises is categorized as a hinge movement? It's going to be a deadlift. It's going to be a hinge movement. It's going to be a deadlift. Which movement category includes upper body exercises in which the arms themselves or the arms and a tool move away from the body? Which of the following movement categories includes upper body exercises in which the arms themselves or the arms and a tool are moving away from the body? Away from the body is going to be push. What, what is an agonist of the, at the shoulder during upper body vertical pulling movements? An agonist at the shoulder during an upper body vertical pulling movement. An agonist at the shoulder during an upper body vertical pulling movement is going to be the latissimus dorsi. An upper body vertical pulling movement is going to be latissimus dorsi. An agonist at the shoulder during an upper body vertical pulling movement is going to be the latissimus dorsi. An agonist at the shoulder. During an upper body vertical pulling movement, when it is vertical like this, you are working the latissimus dorsi, like the lateral pull downs. An agonist on the shoulder during an upper body vertical pulling movement is going to be the latissimus dorsi. What type of exercise are often single joint movements that can promote muscular adaptations? Like strength and hypertrophy, it's going to be isolation exercises. What movement is functions of course when a synergist muscle takes over a movement pattern? When an agonist fails, it's going to be synergist dominance. A movement is function of the course when a synergist muscle takes over a movement pattern when an agonist fails, it's going to be the synergistic dominance. And according to the study of prometics, what is considered a personal distance between two people? 1.5 to 4 feet is going to be, according to the study of prometics, what is considered a personal distance between two people is going to be from 1.5 to 4 feet. According to the study of, Pro of proxemics, according to the study of proxemics, what is considered a personal distance between two people is going to be between 1.5 to 4 feet. And then we go over nutrition foundations of supplementation. A personal distance between two people is going to be 1.5 to 4 feet. So again, exercise selection and technique. What is an exercise selection? Exercise selection and technique. What is exercise progression? Modification to acute learning variables that increases the challenge of a movement pattern. Body language, body relations, body language, are examples of a type of communication, non-verbal communication. What type of learners learn best when they can see the information being tough? It's visual learners. Which type of, which of the following is, is advised when giving verbal cues? Uh, to increase client understanding, you need to use uh, simplified language. Which of the following exercises is categorized as a hinge movement? Hinge movement like the Romanian deadlift or, yeah, like the Romanian deadlift. Uh, which of the following exercises is categorized as a hinge movement? It's going to be a hinge movement, it's going to be a deadlift. Hinge movement is going to be the deadlift. Which movement category? A hinge movement is going to be the deadlift. And now, which movement category includes upper body exercises which the arms and or the arms and the tool are moving away from the body? Which movement category includes upper body exercises in which the arms themselves or the arms and a tool are moving away from the body? It's going to be the push. What is the agonist of the shoulder in upper body vertical pulling movements? What is the agonist at the shoulder during an upper body vertical pulling movement? The agonist at the shoulder during an upper body vertical pulling movement is going to be the latissimus dorsi. During an upper body vertical pulling movement is going to be the latissimus dorsi, the latissimus dorsi. What type of exercises are often single joint movements that can promote muscular adaptations like strength and hypertrophy? It's going to be isolation exercises. Which movement is functional, of course, when a synergistic muscle takes over the movement pattern when an agonist fails? The movement is functional that occurs when a synergistic muscle takes over a movement pattern when an agonist fails is going to be a synergistic dominance. The movement is functional, of course, when a synergistic muscle takes over a movement pattern uh, when an agonist fails is going to be a synergistic dominance. A movement is functional, of course, when a synergistic muscle takes over a movement pattern when an agonist fails that's going to be a synergist when an agonist fails and movement the function of course when a synergist mus a muscle takes over a movement pattern when when an agonist fails when an agonist fails when an agonist fails that's going to be synergist synergistic dominance that's going to be synergistic dominance 
there's going to be syner syner synergistic dominance. When an agonist fails, there's going to be synergistic dominance. Synergistic dominance. When dysfunction occurs when a synergist muscle it takes over a movement pattern. Uh, when an agonist fails, when an agonist fails, when an agonist fails, there's going to be uh, syner synergist do synergistic dominance. Synergistic dominance. Synergistic dominance. And finally, according to the study of prome uh, synergistic dominance. And finally. According to the study of proxemics, what is considered a personal distance between two people, 1.5 to 4 feet? According to the study of proxemics, what is considered a personal distance between two people? is going to be the personal distance between two people is going to be between 1.5 to 4 feet. And that was it for this chapter. Thank you very much. We are done with uh, day 5. It's going to be 1.5 to 4 feet. Like the, the next topic is going to be nutrition foundations and supplementation. Uh, that's going to be a topic that we are not going to go into much detail since it's only 10% of the exam and there's going to be a maximum of only 14 questions for this exam for that one. Uh, we have studied for about two and a half hours. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for, for your time. And hopefully this is information is enough or good enough for you to be able to pass the final exam. Uh, thank you guys and see you.